I find it extremely difficult to imagine that string theory is not in some way connected to the correct quantum gravity theory for our universe. What makes it difficult is that the, the connection might be quite hard to trace. You know, we have the standard model of particle physics, which uh, describes every experiment we've ever done outside of, you know, cosmology and gravity. And I think there'd be very few people who, who would argue that what goes on inside a zebra, for example, is in some way in violation of the standard model of particle physics. But that does not mean that we know how to explain the behavior of a zebra starting from the laws of the standard, you know, the Lagrangian or whatever, you know, the equations that we have for the standard model of particle physics. It's too far removed and it's much more complex. It's so many layers and levels away from where the theory is simple. We can't bridge that gap. But that doesn't mean we think the that the standard model of particle physics is wrong. It, you know, it's just not, yeah, it's too far, it's too far removed. String theory might be simple at energy scales that I discussed earlier, you know, where you'd have to go like a million billion times higher than current accelerators, but we, we can't test it at those scales. And so then to connect the fundamental equations to what we actually see today in, in, at the low energies that we can access, well, that's very hard to do, especially if you don't understand the theory completely as we do. Uh, and I think we don't. We don't understand string theory completely. Anyone who belittles string theory as completely irrelevant has not been paying attention to the numerous recent developments in quantum field theory. I think the most obvious examples is the famous correspondence, which is a duality between different string theories and certain types of field theories. I would dare to say that string theory also provides insight into what a unified theory of quantum gravity might look like. Partly because of theoretical and mathematical difficulties, and partly because of the extremely high energies needed to test these theories experimentally. There is so far no experimental evidence that would unambiguously point to any of these models being a correct and full description of the universe. The strongest scientific argument in favor of string theory is that it appears to contain a theory of gravity embedded within it, and thus may provide a solution to the problem of reconciling Einstein's general relativity with quantum mechanics and the rest of particle physics. There are two fundamental problems that are hard to get around. First, string theory predicts that the world has 10 space-time dimensions, but we don't see them. And matching string theory with reality requires accepting six more unobserved spatial dimensions. All the predictions of the theory depend on how you do this, but there are a huge number of possible choices, and no one has any idea how to determine which is correct. The second concern is that even the part of string theory that is understood is kind of inconsistent. This aspect of the theory relies on a series expansion, an infinite number of terms that one is supposed to sum together to get a result. Whereas each of the terms in the series is probably finite, their sum is almost certainly infinite. String theorists actually consider this inconsistency to be a virtue, because otherwise they would have an infinite number of consistent theories of gravity on their hands, one for each way of wrapping up six dimensions, with no principle for choosing among them. To say that string theory is not a scientific theory is just wrong. I have mixed feelings about this sort of thing because, in string theory, the unification of all forces is untestable, having failed to make any predictions, and by the conventional understanding of the scientific method, it's past the time at which most theorists should have abandoned it and moved on. On the other hand, I don't see at all the point to arguing about the term scientific theory. I believe in string theory. The emergence project within Stanford is open to all ideas. The idea is that in order to view string theory as a theory of the universe, we need to view it as providing a unique measure on the high energy theories. This would be computed by understanding both the structure of the landscape and the dynamics of cosmic inflation. We can then compare our observations to the predictions of this measure. And if they are atypical, the theory is ruled out. We are far from doing this except for the imprecise measurement that seems to more or less work for the cosmological constant. This seems just as scientific to me as quantum mechanics, except that we don't yet know how to compute the probabilities. So if you have two theories and they're in conflict with each other, um, in this case, Einstein's theory of gravity and the sort of general framework of quantum mechanics that worked so well in the world of particles and, and uh, 
subatomic phenomena and so on, and they don't fit together, well, okay, it's clear that at least one of them has to be wrong, but why were we so sure it's not quantum mechanics that's at fault, right? Well, how come everybody is saying, oh, we got to quantize gravity as if it's gravity that's the problem, we got to make it more like the other, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the teacher's pet, quantum mechanics. And so this, I, I remember asking some, some famous professor even that I ran into, uh, you know, I think he was Heisenberg's successor. Uh, why is everybody wanting to quantize gravity? You know, it couldn't be the other way around. I have no idea what he answered. He was probably like, was this crazy kid. Hawking had every right to say, look, I have studied an effect that has to do with quantum gravity. It can give us a hint. It can give us some information about what we should expect from a quantum theory of gravity that unifies quantum mechanics and gravity. And the hint is crystal clear. Unitarity is going to have to go. Always, when you overthrow some theory, you have to explain why it worked so well. So, in Hawking's case, he would have to understand eventually why, if unitarity isn't fundamentally true, why it looks like it's true, you know, m most of the time. And people came up with arguments why that would be a very hard case to make. But it's not like that has never happened before. Every time we come up with a new theory, you know, when when Newton came up with... with uh, the, you know, his universal law of gravity, he had to explain why Kepler was, was essentially right about the orbits of planets. So he had to do a calculation in his new theory to see that that comes out as a limiting case, you know, as a special case. When Einstein replaced Newton's theory of gravity with general relativity, he had to do exactly the same thing again. He had to show how Newton's apparent, you know, force law comes out of a theory in which there aren't even any forces, just curvature of space and time and things trying to go as straight as they can. Um, and it is quite miraculous, you know, to see a law that's, you know, formulated even in such completely different language, like Newton's force law, emerge from these totally different concepts. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing, you know, when it, when it works, but that's definitely some, you know, that's a test. That's the first test of your new theory. It's what, unfortunately, most crackpots who send me emails, you know, don't understand is that your new theory doesn't just have to explain some esoteric thing that we don't understand the answer to. It also can't just, you know, we can't just give up on everything else that we've already explained. You have to recover all that stuff. I think no reason a priori to think that that couldn't happen. So I think from Stephen's point of view, I'm really guessing, I never asked him this, but it would have been very reasonable for someone to say, look, I've discovered that unitarity is not fundamentally true. Information can be lost in nature. Um, it's a quantum gravitational phenomenon. And you know, when we have the full theory, we'll understand why it looks a lot of the time like, like it's not lost. You know, that was, that was to, be, to be determined. As to experimental evidence, this isn't an issue specific to string theory. Actually, actually, I think that string theorists are more interested in phenomenology than those working on other approaches to quantum gravity where, aside from lip confessions, the interest is a grand total of zero. My point of view has always been that quantum gravity isn't science as long as one doesn't at least try to find experimental evidence. The only other thing worth doing is to prove that one particular theory is the only possible one given certain assumptions, and there doesn't seem to be much effort devoted to this either. As to experimental evidence, this isn't an issue specific to string theory. Actually, actually, I think that string theorists are more interested in phenomenology than those working on other approaches to quantum gravity, where, aside from lip confessions, the interest is a grand total of zero. My point of view has always been that quantum gravity isn't science as long as one doesn't at least try to find experimental evidence. The only other thing worth doing is to prove that one particular theory is the only possible one given certain assumptions, and there doesn't seem to be much effort devoted to this either. As a string theory researcher and as an emergence project member, I believe it's better to leave Professor Suskind to say some relevant words in defending string theory. There are criticisms, or oh, incidentally, one might point out that most of these ideas grew not just out of a combination of quantum mechanics and gravity, 
but string theory. How string theory got into it, I haven't really said very much about. But let me tell you that all of the precise examples, all the mathematically precise examples of this correspondence tend to come from systems which were invented or discovered in string theory. Of string theory, quantum gravity has been the victim of an enormous amount of criticism. The criticism, which the first of all thing is unjustified, but what does it have to do with it? The criticism, I would say, stems from the fact, and I think it is a fact, that good science almost always spreads its influence far and wide into many fields of, of not just physics, but even outside of physics, and in particular, into engineering, into technology. And that's a pattern that we've seen over and over and over again. Special relativity led to nuclear energy. General relativity, we use it for navigation by satellite, believe it or not. Quantum mechanics, the list of technological advantage, uh, advances. And quantum mechanics was not invented by people trying to do um, uh, technology. It was invented by people who are curious about the atom. Uh, quantum mechanics, among other things, it led to the MRI machine. But so many things that I have that the list would, uh, would go on and on. Quantum electrodynamics, trying to understand the quantum mechanics of electrons and photons, in particular photons, led to the laser, or at least it's closely connected with the laser, and so forth and so on. What about quantum gravity, general relativity and its connection to quantum mechanics? It seems so infinitely remote with no connections or applications to the rest of science. It could be that that's true. It could be we're just stuck with that. But that has not been what is happening. First of all, these connections between quantum mechanics and gravity have led to new insights into strictly uh, phenomena which seem to have nothing to do with gravitation. For example, the surface of a black hole, the horizon of a black hole, behaves as if it were made of a fluid. That's something that general relativists, general relativists discovered a long time, but not just a fluid, but a quantum fluid, whatever that means. One can use the fact, by knowing enough about black hole physics and knowing enough about general relativity, you can compute properties of fluids that were too hard to compute otherwise. Here's one example of something that was inspired by the connection between fluid mechanics black holes in quantum mechanics. It's a bound on the viscosity of fluids. Now, that doesn't seem to have anything to do with either of those subjects. Well, it's a little bit quantum mechanical. It is quantum mechanical. Eta is the, is the viscosity of a fluid, the stickiness of it. S on the right-hand side is the entropy per unit volume of the fluid, the heat per unit volume. What was discovered in the context not discovered by people doing fluid dynamics, people comparing properties of black quantum mechanical black hole horizons with fluids, is that the viscosity is always greater than equal to some number that includes h bar, that includes the quantum constant, times the entropy density. Will that have impact into fluid dynamics and into, uh, probably. There are things called strange metals. Strange metals are a form of matter that was discovered by condensed matter physicists. Are they important in technology? I don't really know, but they were discovered about 30 years ago, and they were met metallic systems which behaved just differently than ordinary metals. It's turning out that those strange metals are mathematically identical the certain special kinds of black holes called extremal black holes or near extremal black holes. Both sides are quantum mechanical. One side is also gravitational, extremal black holes. The other side is the pure quantum mechanics of certain materials. Information scrambling, the thing which I told you accounts for the falling of the apple as it, as it accelerates in the gravitational field. Information scrambling is an important thing in quantum computer science. The information scrambling from black holes 
led to a bound. Again, another bound that a certain constant called the Yapanov exponent in information scrambling is always less than some other constant. That now is considered a reliable fundamental bound on how fast information can spread through a quantum mechanical system. I told you that Linus cannot get through the wormhole. Well, I was a little bit too pessimistic. With a little bit of help from something called classical, the exchange of classical information, these little purple dots being sent from one side to the other, that's just ordinary Morse code, for example, but has no information about it, about Linus or about anything else inside the wormhole, with a little bit of help from a little bit of classical information, you can slow down that growth of the wormhole. You can slow it down enough so that indeed Linus can get through it. That phenomenon, which was discovered in the context of gravity and quantum gravity, has led to a new protocol and new experiments for quantum teleportation. Quantum teleportation is a real thing. You can teleport information. What it means, you can't exceed the speed of light, but you can send information in a way that is completely hidden, 100% hidden, cannot be decoded by an eavesdropper. And so it's led to new protocols for quantum teleportation. Experiments are now being done to confirm that this can happen, not in black holes, but in quantum computers. I'm not allowed to tell you that the experiments are, are, are successful because I promise not to mention that they're being done and that they're working out successfully, so I won't. Quantum complexity theory, the growth of wormholes, the whole idea of gravitation being controlled by the growth of complexity has led to many new insights into how complexity of quantum systems evolve. We've seen advances coming from gravity in error correction. Error correction is the big hang-up in trying to build a quantum computer. It's too easy to make errors in a quantum computer. You have to error correct for them. And a whole new insight into error correction has come from thinking about gravitational systems again. And finally, in the hands of one of my favorite physicists, Juan Maldacena, uh, much of what we're talking about has had a very interesting influence in cosmology, in inflationary cosmology. So far from being a totally isolated thing, outside the framework of any other science, this quantum gravity is beginning to have an effect, which let's just put it this way, condensed matter physicists, and quantum computer physicists and theoretical cosmologists are being forced to learn what ADS-CFT means. And they are learning it. They're learning it and using it. So this is exciting. This is a very, very exciting period in the development of physics. It is also one which is very, very difficult to explain to a general audience. You know, when you give a lecture like this, well, what did Lincoln say? You can please half of the people, half of them, blah, 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 the time. Well, you can, you can please half of the audience, uh, half of the time, and so forth and so on. I think the real truth is, in a lecture like this, you can, you, you're lucky if you can, uh, if you can satisfy any piece of the audience, even a little bit, because the ideas are complicated, they're difficult, and so forth. You do your best. Uh, you do your best to try to explain, and I've tried to explain as well as I can. I hope you have gotten something out of it. I hope there's at least one person who has gotten something out of this lecture, uh, and I thank you for listening.